Flight 8 lifts off from Pad A at the launch site, Booster 16 undergoes cryo and thrust puck testing in Masses, Ship 32's last parts move to the scrapyard at Sanchez, and more evidence of the new Gigabay layout at the build site. Welcome to episode 75 of Starbase Flyver Update. We'll cover all the Starbase development from the 25th of February through to the 7th of March. Two weeks have gone by since the last flyover, with plenty to see from this low altitude post launch flyover. My name's Jeff A, so let's buckle up and enjoy the latest flight from 1,200 feet. Let's begin with a recap of Starship Flight 8. Thursday, March 6th, would mark the second attempt of Starship Flight 8 after the scrub on March 3rd, following several automated holds as well as a lower than acceptable pressure reading for a spin start of two of the outer Raptor engines on the booster. While working this problem, systems also triggered a hold on the booster LOX levels which resulted in an early end to the launch attempt. With improved weather on Thursday, wind conditions were still a watch item but would not result in any problems for the launch attempt. The second attempt at launch would successfully lift off at 5.30pm local time after a brief hold at the T-40 second mark. As has become common, the ascent of the full stack would go nominally with all 33 Raptor engines lit. Hot staging would take place at T plus 2 minutes and 41, lighting all six Raptors on ship 34. Booster 15 would perform its flip manoeuvre to orient it for the boost back burn and return to the launch tower. This time, only 11 of the 13 inner engines would relight. However, the catch attempt was still proceeding nominally. While the booster was making its way back, the ship was looking good as it pushed on with its mission. At T plus 3 minutes and 33 seconds, we got a great view looking out of the aft of the ship where the Texas coastline and vapour trail of ascent can be seen in the distance. While a bit more difficult to see, a Mach Diamond could be seen from one of the sea level engines. At T plus 4 minutes and 48, the booster is pitching over for the final phase of return, having already jettisoned the hot staging ring, seen floating away from the booster moments later. As the booster approached 1 km in altitude, the command to light the inner 13 engines would be sent to initiate the landing burn. While only 12 of them would relight, like booster 14 on flight 7, a Raptor that did not burn for the boost pack would return to help slow the booster prior to reducing to the centre 3 engines for the final approach to the tower. Booster 15 would touch down on the chopsticks at T plus 7 minutes and 2 seconds. In a new operation for this flight, once the booster was resting on the landing rails, the chopsticks pivoted to the north away from over the OLM. It's unclear what this may have been for. At T plus 7 minutes and 45 seconds, views looking back from the ship would return with Mac diamonds clearly visible on some of the sea level and vacuum raptors. A closer look at this view shows some indications that foreshadow the remaining time in flight, what appears to be an orange hue to the aft of the ship. Around the centre 3 Raptors, either smoke or possibly venting nitrogen from the fire suppression system can be seen. Also, on the side of the Arvac engine to the left, part of the engine bell is also glowing hot. Nine seconds later, the camera would cut to an exterior view in which the attitude of the ship appears to begin changing with the aft rotating to the right from this angle. At T plus 8 minutes and 3 seconds, the Arvac engine that was seen glowing suddenly shuts off, followed rapidly by the loss of all three centre engines. Views would change to the starboard forward flap where the rapid unscheduled disassembly of the Raptor engines can be seen as a cloud of smoke and vapour exiting the aft of the ship. Having lost all control authority provided by the centre 3 engines and the off-axis thrust still provided by the remaining vacuum engines, the ship entered an uncontrolled state with the two remaining engines continuing to burn according to telemetry. Both engines were shut down according to on-screen graphics before it appears telemetry was lost around 9 minutes 30 into the flight. Once again, social media would come alive as views of the debris raining back to the surface was witnessed. Due to the clear skies south of Florida, eyewitnesses observed the ship tumbling and then re-entering all along the Atlantic coast from Miami to the Cape. Observers from the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos and the Dominican Republic all posted images. Like during Flight 2, Astronomy Live was tracking the ship and was able to record video from his 11-inch telescope that included the early moments while the ship was tumbling and continued into re-entry as it began to burn up before ultimately losing sight. Later in the evening, Elon would post to X that this was a minor setback, with the next ship being ready in 4-6 to six weeks. Keep an eye out for further details from SpaceX in the coming days and weeks. Following the successful return of Boost 15 to the launch site, it spent the night resting on the OLM still attached to the chopsticks. 
It would be removed from the OLM the following day and rolled back to Mega Bay 1 in the early morning hours of March 9th. Thanks to Lab Padre for this clip. Continuing at Pad A, the roadside offload area is taking delivery of liquid nitrogen and oxygen. The vent near the tanks operate while trucks are offloading into the tank farm. Some of the new hardware would see damage from Flight 8's exhaust plume. Looking at the new vaporizers, several of them are now leaning away from the pad. Beginning March 8th, these damaged pieces of hardware were removed for repairs. Moving toward Pad B, the deluge tanks are all nearly in place. Four large tanks and four small tanks are mounted. There is hardware for one additional small tank in place. Work continues on the flame trench at Pad B. Unfortunately, the low angle of the limited images didn't give us a view within. Some short drone clips from the Flight 8 broadcast showed that the rebar along the base of the trench is progressing with ramps now being formed. New steel wall sections arrived, these are similar to the Tower 2 base in that they will be filled with concrete. Here's a render from Chrome Kiwi over on X to better visualise how they could possibly be placed into the trench. The largest progress here is in the construction of the BQD gantry. The angled columns for each end are missing, but the remaining framework appears to be complete. Now let's move to Massey's for more updates. Let's begin with Booster 16. It conducted two cryo tests on the 1st and 4th of March and is now being prepared to roll back to the build site for engine installation. At the new Booster cryo stand, welding is continuing on the base with just a few more top plates to be added. Near the can crusher cap, a hydraulic mount ring has arrived. It's similar in construction to the inner and middle ring structures seen in recent months. It's unclear if this is part of the test cage or for the new booster cryo stand. Moving to Rio West, great progress has been made on the homes at the bottom of the site, with two of the homes having their floors poured and walls beginning to be erected, and framing and pipework underway for the next four. At the apartment buildings, roof work is continuing on the row of six apartments, as well as framing for the bottom row of three. Shifting right to the smaller apartments, rapid progress has been made on the construction and pouring of the garages, with the first three having the walls fully poured and formwork for the rest continuing to the right. The pillars indicate that the upper levels will be built directly over the garages. Finally, let's take a look at the lot adjacent to the Ad Astra school, where a large number of mobile homes have been relocated from the village. Grading work is taking place to the right, but it is unclear whether this area is being prepared as a permanent spot for these homes. And now, on to Sanchez. Let's begin at the new OLM, where the water delivery manifold for the top plate has been installed. Both the manifold and the top plates have been trimmed to prepare for the addition of connection elbows. Closer to the highway, the latest booster transport stand has been equipped with guardrails, leaving just the electrical components and clamp mechanism still to be installed. More of these stands will be required as each booster successfully returns from flight. Further along, a truck is delivering additional spokes for the white jigs assembled in this area. Several of these spokes are already staged nearby. A new smaller factory jig has arrived, prefabricated rather than constructed on site. At the flame bucket, welding is ongoing with six tubes still to be installed. These tubes are staged nearby. Near the SQD arm, one of the tower elevator cars has been positioned. Additionally, since the last flyover, more transformers have been staged to the left of the SQD arm, likely intended for the launch site expansions. The final parts of Ship 32, including the nose cone, have been relocated to the scrapyard. The top section of Ship 26 remains to be demolished. The two SPMTs are visible in the rocket garden after delivering the ship transport stand having returned from transporting Ship 34 to the launch site, RIP. Further back, the parking garage wall is now fully painted white. With that overview complete, let's shift to the build site. Finally, let's take a look at the build site, where we can expect a brand new bay to be going up pretty soon. The first hint of Gigabay came in a job posting in November of last year. As a reminder, SpaceX plans to construct another Gigabay in Cape Canaveral, Florida, starting April 1st of this year. SpaceX also announced a second Gigabay to be built here at Starbase. Our best prediction is that it will occupy the entire space between the parking garage and the Star Factory. Here's what we think the footprint will be. Looking in through the window on Lab Padre's Rover 1 camera, concrete is being broken up for what is believed to be a new exterior wall to allow the new Gigabay to be built right up against the Star Factory. Shout out to Vix on X and Lab Padre's Rover 1 camera for this image. The lighting for this area of the Star Factory was also removed. 
The Ship Thrust Puck test stand was relocated to Mega Bay 2 on March 9th. Subsequently, Ship 35 was mounted onto the stand before being transported to the Massey's test facility for its cryogenic testing regimen. Now let's move on to Boca Chica Village. The temporary housing buildings in this location are gone, and the recently poured concrete is getting torn up. SpaceX intends to build an apartment building in this exact location, as seen in this Cameron County Clerk filing posted by Neil Anderson on X. Well, that's it for episode 75 of Starbase Flyover Update. Thank you for choosing to fly with RGV Aerial Photography, and we hope you all enjoyed the flight. If you liked what you saw today, please subscribe for more episodes and content so you don't miss out on the new videos each week. My name's Jeff A, and we hope to see you next time from 10,500 feet.